Okay, yes, we're gonna get started, everybody. We have Larry Katz here, Professor Emeritus at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, with a lot of experience in animal science, and he's gonna take us down a little bit more of an academic road than we're used to, which I'm very excited about. And we've got um, artifacts to talk about, we have evolution to talk about, and um, we're gonna talk about how we got to where we are with all these um, cats and dogs and other companion animals in our lives. So I'm gonna hand it over to Larry and I just appreciate all of you coming to our tail talks. Um, we keep on expanding and, and thanks for, for being part of this experiment of our first virtual tail talk <laughs> and enjoy. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to this for some time and uh, I'm going to uh, get right into the topic. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen so you can see my presentation. Uh, let's just make sure, uh, are you able to see this uh, diagram? Give me a thumbs up if you can, and then I can see. Uh... We can see. Great, excellent, thank you. So this particular um, uh, collection of, of artwork was drawn by a student of mine a number of years ago. He's um, uh, he's quite a talented young man, and he was taking my course in companion animal science. And, and I used to look at his drawings of dinosaurs, and I said to him, uh, Chris, why don't you um, make some drawings of the ancestral, what we think are the ancestral species of animals that we have domesticated. And so he assembled these watercolors. Um, beautiful watercolors that I have then uh, scanned and, and put into this diagram. I'm going to focus primarily on these guys up here in the corner today, uh, but I'm going to talk about some general features of, uh, of domestication and really, you know, how this human animal bond has developed over time. It is an ancient, ancient bond. And so let's see if my technology is uh, this picture of the wolf. So the question and and our discussion today is, how did we get from here to here? It took quite a few years and quite a few changes and some very interesting adaptations of both humans and, and animal species. And so um, I want to emphasize that this development of a bond, particularly with dogs and cats, is a global phenomenon. It's not just a North American one. And I have some data. I'm just going to show you a graph with a little bit of data here just to give you a sense. This represents the countries that have the most dogs as pets. And you can see the U.S. Uh, outstrips all the other countries uh, by twofold with more than uh, 60 million dogs in, in uh, U.S. households. Uh, Brazil comes up uh, pretty high, South Africa and so forth. So lots and lots of dogs in the world and cats too. I don't want to discount the importance of cats. And again, more cats in the U.S. than there are dogs. Um, this was a change that took place um, over the last decade or so as families sort of changed into two, two worker households. Where, where the adult, where the people were out of the house for much of the day. And so the shift towards cats uh, reflected the fact that they don't need quite as much care on a, on a continuous basis as, as does um, the dog. And, and um, cats uh, were not, have not been domesticated as long as dogs, but we have a long, long history uh, with, with both cats and dogs and other species as well, high on the list of, of companion animals uh, that people bond with are, include fish and birds and um, even livestock species um, some people keep as, as pets. So our relationship with animals is an ancient one. And I want to talk a little bit about you know, how, the, how this may have developed. So I need to now uh, turn the clock back uh, quite a few thousand years and have you imagine uh, what it might have been like living in Paleo Paleolithic times um, when uh, this particular mammoth w could represent entire season's food for your entire mm -hmm. clan, but how to bring down an animal that is as large as this, and as dangerous as, as this, 
What's Nina peed at 4.30, but Tell Anna her. hasn't peed since 2 o'clock. So humans can being out. clever <laughs> and observant. Please lean in the house if you want. Watched. But Nina peed at 4.30. The of wolves. And so in this artistic rendition of, of a wolf pack hunting the mammoth, you can see this, the chase and eventually um, the animals may have encircled the mammoth, fatigued them, perhaps wounded them. And humans learned from this. And now if you think this is just an artistic rendition of how Am I back on? Okay. I'm not sure how long I was muted. Um, <laughs> the um, This artistic rendition shows wolves bringing down a, a large mammoth. And if you now look at this photograph that was taken not that long ago, an aerial view, this was in Yellowstone Park. And these are wolves uh, that chose uh, American bison as their prey species. And the behavior of these wolves included chasing them down, encircling them, fatiguing them, and very strategically placing themselves so that uh, animals at the front uh, could distract while animals at the rear could come in and, and, and sort of hamstring the bison to bring it down. And then the whole pack would come in for the kill. And so, um, Humans learned by watching the wolves bring down big game that this cooperative hunting makes a whole lot of sense. And so in this particular artistic rendition, um, you can see uh, an, uh, a human, anci ancient times, but this is Homo sapiens sapiens, a modern human, um, a, uh, working cooperatively uh, with, these, with these wolves. Now, this was an interesting change in our in our. Um, evolutionary history because this this cooperation was was observed, probably done by modern humans homo sapiens um, but not necessarily done by neanderthals there's a lot of evidence from archaeological digs that shows where the modern humans um, had had lived the bones and the skins that are preserved come from very large animals. And in the similar digs for the places where Neanderthals uh, lived, the bones are of much smaller animals. So as we were moving into cold age, into an ice age where food became somewhat uh, scarce, modern humans uh, uh, had a real advantage in being able to feed their families and make it through these cold periods. And you know, people have speculated, you know, what happened to Neanderthals? You know, did humans hunt them down? Probably not. Um, in fact, there's good evidence that humans and Neanderthals interbred because probably all of us are carrying genes, Neanderthal genes, a small percentage. Um, and, and many people in this, in this field believe that humans just outcompeted the Neanderthals because they were able to... Um, uh, feed themselves during during harsh climates uh, much more successfully uh, uh, than than did the Neanderthals. And there's some interesting work across species that looks at hunting success based on hunting strategy. So this is a little bit of a of a confusing diagram, but I'll I'll take you through it in a way that where it should make sense. So basically, you're looking at the predators across the top of the screen and the different prey species at the bottom and the prey species are arranged uh, based on their body size. And so I, if you look at this uh, lower right hand corner, these are the larger prey species. And now who were successfully bringing down these animals, if you follow the lines sort of up and to the left, it's pointing to species that hunt in packs that hunt cooperatively so that they could bring down these large, potentially very dangerous animals successfully and therefore uh, uh, be able to feed uh, large numbers of people or feed their families or their clan uh, through long periods periods of time. And as you move leftwards on this lower scale to the smaller species, you find that yes, these were taken by uh, uh, species that hunt in packs, but also 
those animals that hunt in a more solitary way were more, more successful at bringing down game that were smaller. And we think the Neanderthals were probably bringing, primarily bringing down small, small game rather than uh, the much larger game, uh, making their food availability much more scarce. Now I'm gonna take you through a series of slides of archeological findings that gives you a sense of the ancient relationship between uh, humans and, and the progenitors of dogs as an example of a domesticated species, um, because it really gets at the nature of the changes that have been taking place, that took place among humans, as well as among the animal species. So um, this first slide is a 32,000 year old specimen. And in this, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the skull label B and the skull label C represent fossilized um, wolves. And then this one upper left-hand corner A is what has been termed the Goyette dog, Goyette for a uh, region in Belgium where, where the fossil was found. And what the, what the archeologists have done here is they've measured the brain space, the cranium, the brain space. So it's a little hard to see on a screen, but if you look at the, at the width of the cranium, of the Goyette dog and compare that to what was then a similar time period for a um, wolf at the time, you see the brain, the brain has expanded quite a bit, suggesting that at this point, even 32,000 years ago, this animal was undergoing some changes that uh, allowed it to develop a greater behavioral repertoire, perhaps a greater behavioral plasticity and, and it's thought uh, part of that was related to some loose associations with humans. And so some people refer to this Goyette dog as the proto dog, maybe that intermediate step between, uh, between the, the wolf and what would later become the domesticated dog. And so if you look at how long ago, this 32,000 years ago. So our relationship with these animals is ancient, ancient, ancient. Many, liter many of you may read sites that say dogs have been domesticated for 8,000 years. Some places will say 10,000 years. That process began much, much earlier than that. And increasing evidence is, is supportive of, of that. Um, this next finding um, relates to an interesting story. It's not the dog per se. Um, this is actually a, a fox, uh, remains of a fox head from 15,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago. Now, what's interesting about this particular finding is that the head of the fox was located in the grave site of what was thought to be the burial site of the leader of this clan. But what, what was also determined by the archaeologists was that at some point after the leader had been buried, his body was exhumed and reburied in another location. And when they moved him from one site to another site, they took the fox's head with them and buried the fox's head along with this leader. Okay, and the thinking is that this is not a prey species. This was likely a relationship that this person had with this fox. So as much as 15,000 years ago, here's evidence that there were, again, this, this bond between a human and a non-human um, was, was so strong that among the valuables that might have been placed um, in the grave site with this leader was the head perhaps of its, of its companion, of its, of its, favored, of its favored animal. Um, interesting history that we have. Probably the most famous of the fossil findings um, was this uh, this site in in what is now Israel, the Natufian uh, settlement. This is a twelve thousand year old uh, fossil, and it's uh, the remains are of a woman who was buried in this um, uh, position. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, it's a little difficult to see here, but in three dimension, if you're in the museum, <laughs> you can see much better. She was buried with a puppy and her hand is cradling the bones of the puppy. So she was caressing this animal. There's no evidence of any um, marks, damage marks on the bones of this puppy. So this was not, this was not food placed in because there were many prey species that were often buried with people, but 
uh, this puppy was not put in here to be to be her food in the afterlife. This puppy was put here to be her companion um, in the afterlife. And so it, again, um, ancient relationship, close relationship, important bonds that were developing between between um, these dogs and people. Another really interesting site, um, uh, fossil find, a little hard for us to tell from a, from a picture like this. Uh, this is about 10,000 BC, and this is a dog's head, and you can't really see what this is, but um, it's described as a bone that was positioned in the animal's in the animal's mouth. And so, once again, this was a burial site where this animal was probably a, a pet, a companion, and for the and while the humans were buried with food and sustenance and gifts and supplies that they would have to bring to the afterlife with them, this dog was also provisioned with a bone, something that it could have um, in its uh, uh, in its afterlife. Um, there's no there's no evidence that any of the prey species, you know, that that humans were eating, um, were buried in these sites in in with the same sort of um, compassion and care as what as was happening uh, with these with these dogs. So again, ancient ancient relationships. This is in North America from eight thousand years ago in a very carefully preserved um dog skeleton that um was was buried in the same location by the way as as where human burials were taking place uh, so it's not like these were dumped somewhere remotely um, these these were cared for even after even after death so one can imagine over time that as the relationship with with the dog began to change it probably started with some sort of loose associations where the wolves were perhaps tolerant of being near humans the humans were tolerant of the presence of the wolves and their hunting success uh, made this a win-win for all involved because the humans probably had a uh, while they were very smart and they could hunt cooperatively they probably didn't have the same success rate of bringing down game as did the wolves. And so by working together, uh, everyone was probably provisioned with more resources. So, so this was really a selective advantage for the humans who were, who were cooperating with the wolves and the wolves who were cooperating with, with the humans. This tolerance of being around humans led to some rather dramatic changes in, in the anatomy, the physiology, the behavior, and the genetics of these animals that would eventually lead to the domestication of a dog. And over time from this loose association, then these dogs would become uh, a part of the family and a part of the group. And they probably, in addition to uh, assisting with the hunting, they probably also provided some protections for the family. And we have lots of evidence. So I'm gonna show you some of that evidence uh, for the importance of dogs as, as guards uh, for the family and for the clan. They certainly, um, continue to serve that function uh, for many of us today. Um, just a few years ago in Science Magazine, um, there was a publication of these cave um, uh, etchings, uh, carvings, sorry, cave carvings in, in, uh, sand, in sandstone in the Arabian desert. And these, these carvings are about 8,000 years old. And in them, um, what you can see is a hunter. Here's, here's the hunter with his, his bow and arrow. But if you notice, coming off from the hunter are what appear to be leashes to, to dogs. And so in these, probably the oldest graphical depictions of dogs, you see this um, relationship, this important relationship that's established uh, between, uh, between humans and, and the canines. It's really fascinating history and an ancient history uh, that continues to this day. So just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Great Britain and I was visiting the British National Museum. And I was really thrilled to see some of the, the artifacts that are on display. And I have a few pictures of some of the things that were there that uh, you may find interesting. So this is a bronze statue. It's quite small, actually. You can't tell from this picture, but it's you know really only a few inches tall. Um, and this was um, found um, buried uh, near, a, uh, near the entryway to a household some 800 years uh, BC. 
and the thinking that this was this was the representation of a uh, of a god with their mastiff and uh, many of these were found around households at this time and they were thought to ward off evil spirits from the household so uh, so the dog played an important role as a partner within their sort of religious beliefs if you will that they were partners with their deities uh, to protect people from what you know the evils that that they perceived uh, were in their in their world and and this this kind of depictions continued these are clay model clay dogs uh, that typically were found around households and in this particular case the um, design of the clay model um, had very specific kinds of of meanings uh, to the people who who kept them and uh, much of this has been has been interpreted in a variety of ways um, in part uh, thanks to uh, the amazing findings from the uh, uh, ability to understand ancient writings and drawings from uh, what we've gleaned learned from the rosetta stone but just to give you an idea of how how these clay dogs were represented i've listed um, and you can't really see the color very well in the picture and also because of the age of these things but a black dog and the and the phrase was loud is his bark and uh, white dog don't think bite and the blue dog bite her of his foe and the red dog catcher of the enemy and the white dog with red spots expeller of evil so you see the importance sort of a functional in addition to the sort of emotional role that dogs played connected to humans uh, there was this very important functional role and as you move through time uh, this is again a photograph I took at the British National Museum. This is fourth century AD now uh, in Greece. Many, many of the households and the atria, the entryways to the households had beautiful, colorful mosaics. And often the mosaics were representations of hunting scenes. And many, of, I only took the picture of this one, but many of those hunting scenes uh, showed the dogs that participated in the hunt with the humans. So again, uh, the relationship continued, it evolved, it developed um, over time uh, among humans. And coming back to this continent here uh, from a, a state H historical society in North Dakota, uh, you see a, rela a particular relationship of dogs with the Native Americans uh, as, as draft animals. This diagram helps understand uh, the dogs often uh, were harnessed. We have, we have remains of the harnesses that were used. I mean, these, this is actually, a photo, you know, these are photographs, so they're not that old. Um, uh, they were used to pull the travois to tra uh, bring food, supplies, children. Um, and this was, this was probably still used up until some early part of the 19th, early part of the 19th century, certainly into the eight, well into the 18th century. Well, dogs and cats were certainly not the only species uh, uh, that humans domesticated. Uh, we have a long history of, of uh, developing this bond for a variety of reasons, whether it started as religious reasons or sort of economic or, or food reasons. And this particular uh, diagram gives you a sense of the species that have been domesticated and the time period at which these domestications took place. So again, the scale along the top, we have a scale. This is 12,000 years before present, uh, going up to the present time and uh, broken down by whether they were mammals, birds, or fishes. And so you can see quite a few species have been domesticated. And uh, interesting comment I'll make about this. And one of the problems we have with really understanding the history of our domestication of birds those of you know, who know much about birds know that they have a particular anatomy with their long bones and that the, the long bones are hollow. They're very light. Bird, there's very few fossilized birds uh, because the bones deteriorate into dust before they can become fossilized. So it's really difficult to know much about our human relationship with different bird species uh, much earlier than is shown in this diagram because there's just not a whole lot of data out there for us to, um, to really understand what. Uh, what may have been happening and up to current times i mean we are still domesticating some species and those of you who buy salmon in the grocery store if it's not wild caught it's probably a domesticated fish uh, that's raised on farms that's been selected in very particular ways to 
survive in, in captivity without undergoing the long migrations that wild salmon undergo. Um, catfish is a very popular food in many parts of the country. Catfish have been domesticated and selected to eat um, uh, native wild catfish tend to eat on the bottom uh, uh, food uh, materials that have settled sort of in the sort of murky, muddy waters. And that tends to give them kind of a little bit of what many of us might think is an off flavor. But if you go into a restaurant and order catfish, it's going to be a very light, very mild tasting white fish. And it's probably a domesticated catfish that has been selected to eat their formulated diets uh, that's floating on top of the water. So they're not really uh, waiting in the in the mud to get their diet and people who have um, grown up in the southern parts of the United States who are who have um, uh, fished for catfish for for much of their lives hate the, the flavor or the lack of flavor as they would say in the in the domesticated catfish so we have these interesting relationships across across a number of species hard to say too much about a bond with many of the species that we eat but nevertheless uh, there is indeed a bond of sorts with these different species. And in some cases, it's a close personal bond. And in other cases, it's a bond of, um, uh, of a cooperative nature that has um, uh, mostly, <laughs> for the most part, benefited humans because of the, the animal's role as a, as a food uh, source. Um, and humans all over the globe have domesticated various species over over the uh, thousands of generations. And so this is just a global map to give you an idea of where in the world some of the uh, some of these different uh, species from that prior um, graph were were domesticated. Uh, the dog was likely domesticated in northern Europe from the northern uh, uh, from what was then you know the northern gray wolf, though there's some evidence that perhaps, uh, domestic, there's some breeds of dogs that were, um, whose ancestral forms were the dingoes in Australia. Um, the literature on that is rather interesting because some people believe that those animals, it, that there was a migration uh, into Australia of those dogs. So they might, in fact, genetically might be uh, very similar uh, to the descendants of the northern uh, gray wolf. Hard to know for sure, but they're still happy to say there are people doing research in this area. So humans have tried to domesticate a lot of species um, over, over our history. Some have been successful and some have not been so successful. And, and when one looks at the species that have been successfully domesticated and compares that to some of the species that are, have not been so successfully domesticated, what emerges is a series of of traits that are more typically found in species that have been successfully domesticated than species that have not. And so uh, I'll just talk about that for a moment or two. And this idea is, is uh, referred to as a pre-adaptation. So this does not refer to any behavior or trait of an animal that we necessarily have changed in domestication, but rather the naturally occurring uh, behaviors of the animals prior to their domestication. So a pre-adaptation to domestication. Animals that have these pre-adaptations were more likely to be successfully domesticated than animals that didn't. So I'll just take you through a few of these so you get the idea so this makes more sense. So if you look at something like docility, you know, how safe is it to be around them? How easy might it be to tame these animals? Well, you can well imagine that, you know, it might have been a whole lot the success of domesticating an animal that's pretty docile was likely to be greater than the success of domesticating an animal that's like so wild, so dangerous, uh, one that you can't really keep in captivity because it either injures itself, escapes, injures you. You can imagine all the consequences of trying to keep an animal that's that's not docile. Um, a generalist feeder. So animals that have highly selective diets uh, might have been very difficult to, to domesticate because as humans migrated and humans certainly did migrate, uh, if they if they moved from an area where the where the natural feed of this domesticated or this to be hopefully to be domesticated species is not available, then there might have not been success. But if an animal would graze on all the grasses available or eat the 
eat the remains from the humans tables and do well and stay healthy and reproduce, you know, then being a generalist feeder makes sense. You know, a dog that can eat everything that we can eat is more likely to be, you know, successfully domesticated, or I should say a wolf, than, than perhaps a koala bear, right? That's only going to eat the leaves from, from eucalyptus trees, right? They're not going to do so well if you move them away from, from uh, Australia. <laughs> Um, social species, you know, solitary species don't do particularly well uh, when they're forced to be uh, uh, together. Uh, years ago, is a funny story from a from a biotech uh, expert years ago who was developing some transgenic abilities to harvest spider silk to use as a super strong suture material and lightweight material for um, uh, uh, black jackets, you know, for bulletproof vests. Because spider silk, its tensile strength, if you stretch it, is a, on a cross uh, diameter, you know, index. It's a thousand times stronger than than steel. So how can you get how can you get spider silk? Can you harvest spider silk? Well, keeping farms of spiders would be very difficult because they're not social species. And so, as this scientist was saying, you know, if sure we could bring in a whole bunch of spiders. And then we go home for the night and we come back the next morning and there's just one spider with a full belly. You know, it's just not the kind of thing that's going to work. So, uh, you know, the sociality of, of species uh, was important as a pre-adaptation for domestication. Their mating systems was important. If you have animals, animals that would uh, pair bond for life, for example, like geese do and, and uh, other species such as, uh, such as that, um, now, and humans are, are making their adjustments in who's present, who's not present, who survives, who doesn't su survive. They're going to have difficulty reproducing their populations if these animals are very choosy about who they mate with. But if they have like no pair bonds, any male will mate with any female and vice versa, or perhaps males with multiple females, uh, then they're more likely to have success in these in when once these animals are in a captive area where breeding is going to take as long as the animals are docile enough and stay healthy in the presence of humans, then they're likely to be successful at reproduction, uh, at reproducing if, if their mating system is falls into one of these areas. Um, Species that are territorial are, um, uh, are were likely problematic in domestication because if the humans were moving every time they moved to another place and the animals had to sort of reestablish who's the dominant animal in this new territory, there'd be constant battling uh, for establishing a social hierarchy. But if these are animals that are established stable social hierarchies, no matter where they are in space, then you don't have the injuries and the deaths associated with reestablishing a social hierarchy. The dominant animal will remain the dominant animal no matter where they are until, you know, his or her uh, uh, strength in life changes so that there's flux. But um, And then, of course, ecological flexibility. Animals that can live in different kinds of environments uh, more likely to be domesticated than animals that have a very narrow niche requirement where, where they... Uh, uh, would not do well if moved from point A to point B, for example. So I've used this term domestication quite a bit today, but I haven't really told you what it is. And, and I think it's important that we do just spend a minute or two on this, on this idea of, you know, what does it mean to be domesticated? You don't, you don't domesticate an individual. It's species that are domesticated over time. So this is a definition that was that was coined by actually my PhD advisor uh, many years ago, and um, I worked with him on the time, and we spent quite a bit of time, you know, thinking about you know how to how to phrase this in a way that made sense. And I think the most important piece of this was that we really had to define this as a process, and 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 not just a, an event like oh I'm going to domesticate these animals, and and tomorrow you have domesticated animals, but in fact this takes generations and generations of this species who over that period of time become adapted to being near humans, adapted to being in a captive environment. And by adapted, I mean, are able to survive, thrive, and most importantly, and reproduce in these captive environments. And then over time, there are a whole series of genetic changes that would occur that would 
uh, bring about bring about um, the uh, the changes that we see in our domesticated species today. And then interestingly, and this was kind of a a, a new take on this idea of what of how domestication takes place, and it's the notion that. There are typical events that occur during the developmental life of animals that might not lead to genetic changes, but lead to some other behavioral changes. Um, and these are events that occur during each generation. And so using the dog as an example, uh, those of you who know something about socialization in dogs know that during that first, well, let's say for the sake of argument, six weeks of life, the animals that these, that these puppies are exposed to <clears throat> become the species um, to which they um, uh, connect, to which they affiliate, to which they behave in such a way that it's part of their clan. And so puppies that are socialized with other dogs and with humans tend to have normal, well-adjusted behaviors when interacting with other dogs and with humans. And during that six to eight week period of time, if they're not exposed to either humans or to other dogs, they develop long-term behavioral problems associated with sort of social cohesion. And sometimes it's permanent. Sometimes it can be slowly over time in that animal's life. It can be, it can, uh, you can find ways of helping them, helping them adjust. But as you can see, this is a long-term process. It takes generation upon generation. Now, what are the changes? I'll do a little bit of biology here. We won't go too deeply into any of it, but, you know, so how do these genetic mechanisms take place over time. Okay, this first idea is something called genetic drift, okay, where um, you think of this as uh, either a bottleneck or a founder population. So let's say you were going to domesticate some animals and you grabbed all that you could cat in this particular region and you captured all that you were able to maintain and feed and keep in your captivity. Well, in some ways, there's sort of a randomness to who you capture. But then once you have that population, depending upon the genes present in that population, that's going to fix the genetic variability in, the, in that population to a certain extent. So there may be a whole range of animals that belong to that same species, but because they're not part of that founder population, their particular uh, uh, genotypes are not going to be represented in this new population. So some people call this like a bottleneck, because if you think of a big bottle with a narrow neck, and inside the bottle are all the possible animals of a particular species, and now you start to pour it out, and right, and now it goes through this narrow bottleneck, and then you stop pouring. Well, whichever ones made it through that bottleneck now represent the foundation for your new species. And you've left behind all these others that may have very different kinds of genetics associated with their variation. So genetic drift uh, probably played a really important part in sort of narrowing the genetic possibilities uh, when, when we began domesticating animals. Now, once we have this founder population and uh, there's all sorts of inbreeding and that's gonna increase the homogeneity or how similar animals look to one another, how similar their genetics are to one another and so so this inbreeding is why uh, uh, German shepherds look like German shepherds and poodles look like poodles. I mean, a lot of that, that's a lot has come about because of inbreeding. Of course, inbreeding causes some real problems early on, but once those problems are pretty much die out, it has some real advantage. So the professional breeders in the group understand how important inbreeding can be, but how carefully it has to be applied. Artificial selection, you probably know that's where we, where we, we would seek traits in animals that are desirable and then breed those animals that, that, um, that have those, those particular traits. And interestingly, uh, artificial selection can be, can be broken up into what we call conscious or unconscious selection. Conscious selection is, I want the animal with the black hair. And so I'm only going to breed animals that have black hair. Okay, that's, that's intense artificial selection for that trait. But as it turns out, there might be some genes on the same chromosome close to that, the genes that regulate black hair. So maybe when you're selecting for black hair, you're also selecting for something else. And there's good data for that for a number of species, you know, in particular with respect to tameness, that selecting for hair color oftentimes inadvertently or unconsciously selects for docility or tameness. So um, 
a lot of interesting things that took place even before humans understood it, long before Mendel, even before humans understood anything about the mechanisms. These changes were starting to take place because humans did note that offspring looked like the parents. They didn't know why, a spirit or whatever it happened to be, but the observation of the similarity of offspring to parents meant that artificial selection could be taking place even when they didn't know exactly what they were doing. Two other mechanisms, um, natural selection and captivity. So um, no matter how much care we try to give our give species, there are going to be some animals that just won't do well in our captive environment. And so they might not thrive. They might not eat well. They might die. They might not reproduce. Maybe their reproductive output is poorer. And whatever it is about the environment that you now keep them in that influences that reproductive capability um, is sort of described as, well, it's sort of natural selection that's happening in captivity. It may be different kinds of natural selection pressures or traits that are selected in captivity than might happen in the wild. And then in addition, and finally, um, this idea of a relaxation of natural selection. So when we start to care for animals, we take over some of their um, what otherwise would have been um, their, their behaviors or traits that were essential for survival, um, but now we're, we're taking on that role. Maybe we're protecting them from predators, or maybe we're finding uh, uh, a prey species for them to consume. We're doing all these things that they might have had to do for themselves in the wild. Now that they don't have to do it for themselves, those in the population who might have been poor at whatever this task is in the wild and might not have survived to reproduce in the wild now can survive and reproduce in captivity because those selective pressures aren't operating on them. And so in a sense, this is kind of expanding the variability of some traits for these animals that, that uh, are in captivity because you don't have natural selection operating so intensively on some of these kinds of traits. Let me give you one real quick example of this. Um, those of you who know anything about uh, cattle may know that there are um, species of cattle that are called that are referred to as dairy cattle, and there are species of cattle that are referred to as beef cattle. And typically in dairy cattle, uh, when the calf is born, um, it's allowed perhaps to um, uh, obtain some of that first day, that colostrum from its mother, but it's separated. And so the mother doesn't need to exhibit uh, very good maternal care because it has no opportunity to do so. The calf is removed. In the beef cattle industry, the animals are out on the range. And so a calf is born and the mother's, the maternal behavior determines whether or not the calf will survive. So over time, what we see is if for some dairy breeds of animals, if you leave the calf with them, the mother, some of the mothers are not very good mothers. Uh, they might be afraid of the calves. They might not allow the calves to suckle. Whereas you virtually never see that in the beef industry because, uh, because those animals who might have had that poor maternal behavior are gone, have been wiped, have been eliminated from, from the gene pool. So you see this expansion of a trait, even though it's not necessarily an uh, 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 advantageous trait, but you do see these changes because humans have taken on a role. So all of that... Uh, tens of thousands of years or more and understanding something about the genetic mechanisms and domesticating animals uh, for our, for our companionship and for our pleasure um, has, has brought us uh, to this, to, to where we are today, where we could look at these two. You might not even notice the little one down on the bottom of the picture here. Um, these are both dogs. This is the same. These are the, this is the same species. This is a remarkable change. Uh, brought about uh, by virtue of, of sele selective breeding. And it is uh, these animals that have been a part of our lives virtually as long as we have been human. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll be delighted to uh, continue the conversation and answer your questions in, in the time that we have remaining. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, um, we're happy to, uh, Dr. Katz is happy to take them. You can unmute yourself or we can put them in the chat.
Anybody? Any questions? I don't have any. I, that was fascinating. That was really that was really great. Um, I do. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Linda. Hey. <laughs> may I may I say, this is my sister in law, and she's down in South Carolina. Oh, when I'm what's her name? <laughs> oh, you mean I am? I thought she was. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh good to see you that was great um dan and i enjoyed that during our dinner tonight oh good <laughs> um i do have a question i don't know if you can answer this but was there any one particular country who was more advanced in that um process to 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 advance into that stages of dogs so yeah that's an interesting question because much of this was happening before there were countries and so, ah. and so um, if you look at um, now modern breed development, then you find, for example, uh, Great Britain, they were um, uh, deeply engaged in breed development. And so you see lots of breeds that came out of Great Britain. And the other, the other place in Europe where you saw lots and lots of breed development was in, Germ was in Germany. So I would say just off the top of my head, Great Britain and Germany, probably the most active in this, in this respect of, of breed development. And, and uh, <laughs> you hear my companion in the background. Um, I, I couldn't hear. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, no, that's interesting too, because yeah, they were more focused on it and they were around before we were right. Yeah. So that's, that's right. an influence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank there you. There are some, I mean, there are some, there, there are some breeds that were developed in North America, some in South America, Australia. So, you know, across the globe, but I think in terms of the sheer numbers of, of breeds, um, it's gotta be, it's gotta be Great Britain, Great Britain, Germany, Italy might come in as a close, as a close, uh, close second. <laughs> yeah. Just interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome. I guess I have a question too. I don't know how to phrase exactly, but um, I was one of the people before this talk that thought it was about nine, 10,000 years ago. Mm. Um, so I guess I want to know more about cats um, and if that my timeline is correct on that as well. It's, it sounds like it would not be. Um, so do you know, do you know exactly about when cats were domesticated? I know it was kind of more accidental. So yeah, the cat story is a very interesting one. We're, we think that the data on cats is reasonably good. It's suggesting about 6,000 years from the uh, African wildcat. Okay. And, and that um, it started as, a, it's, it's an interesting process because they were revered and respected because of their predatory behavior. And so as, um, as agriculture expanded, and, and humans began storing grains and, uh, that attracted lots of rodents. Yes. And so it was good hunting for the cats. And because the cats were now helping protect these stores of grain, <clears throat> they, were, they were highly respected, highly revered. And then often what happens in association with those same kinds of um, tolerance uh, of being near one another, there's a lot of religious element to it as well. And so often many of these animals that were helpful to humans were viewed as the gods um, placing this godlike creature, this representation of some kind of God on earth to help humans. So there was a lot of religious basis to, uh, to these um, uh, connections or these relationships between people and 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 animals cattle for example were were considered to be the uh, presence of the moon god on earth and in fact the first known surgical procedure of any kind was a manipulation of the so as you can well imagine when a calf is born it doesn't have horns the mothers are very grateful of that and but they have a they have some tissue that's called a horn bud and it's a very small area on the top of their head and then as after birth you know then it starts to grow and grow and grow and what is considered probably the first surgery that was ever performed was a carving of the shape of that horn bud 
which then directed the horn growth into a crescent shape. And so the more they could make those horns look like the moon, the crescent moon, the more sort of godly, the more revered these these animals um, turn, uh, uh, turned out to be. So, yeah, these interesting relationships uh, have a lot of, not always economic, sometimes religious uh, basis. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. Thank you. Um, I know that... Um, Religious reasons are the, a reason that um, that cats fell out of favor um, <laughs> as well. So in the beginning, it was why they were favorable, and then they were out of favor. Now we just, as you said, just recently, they're coming back on top. Right, right, yeah. It, it uh, these things change over time as as uh, cultural shifts and and belief systems change over time. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so do we have any other questions today? I don't, I don't have any. That was, that was so interesting. Oh, um, so we just, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming tonight. This, this was really just, this was great. I um, am even more sad now that I did not get to take a, a class with Dr. Katz while at Rutgers, <laughs> um, but I'm glad I got a little taste. Um, so we really appreciate having you, um, and, you know, hopefully we can do it again sometime. <laughs> I would love to, and it was my distinct pleasure, and uh, I wish all of you a pleasant evening, and, and, uh, enjoy your next, your next tail talk when it, when it, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a great segue. Our next tail talk is August 23rd. We're having it at Dooney's Pub in Voorhees. We're going to do a succulent workshop, uh, where we will be memorializing, our pets and we have a, a bereavement counselor on staff that will talk a little bit about the grieving process um, and we'll make a small um, little succulent dish um, where we can put their their tags on the dish to memorialize our lost pets. Um, so we're gonna raise a glass to our lost pets um, at, a, at a pub. <laughs> and um, awesome. yeah, so hopefully we'll see some of you there. And um, again, thank you so much for everybody tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz. And everybody have a great evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.